Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. All right, now we will do a speaker's choice reading from page 16 in the Big Book. Most of us feel, all right, most of us feel we need look no further for utopia. We have it with us right here and now. Each day, my friend's simple talk in our kitchen multiplies itself in a widening circle of peace on earth and goodwill to men. This meeting ends after the Lord's Prayer. Please remember to silence cell phones and keep distractions to a minimum during the speaker. Tonight, we're excited to have Hannah W. from Big Book Discussion Group from Rochester, New York. Let's give her an enthusiastic welcome. Thank you, everybody. My name is Hannah. I'm an alcoholic. And it's good to be back here. Um, I, I was thinking, someone asked me, like, didn't you speak at one of the first meetings of this group? And I was, I thought about it. I think it was like the third month that this group existed. I, I spoke here and it was my first time ever speaking for the full length because I was from Rochester and we don't like do that there. Um, and I was, I just was so terrified. I was like, I'm not going to fill the time. And I did. Um, cause you know, cause I can t- like, I can talk. Um, that's, <laughs> I had at that point had a spiritual experience, but I was still like very much in my head about it. I mean, I probably still am, but you'll, you'll see. I don't know. You'll be the judge. you be the judge of that, I guess. Um, you can take my inventory. It's fine. Um, my sobriety date is October 10th, 2011. And my home group is the big book discussion group in Rochester, New York. It meets Sunday nights at seven. And, um, it's, it was my home group for the first, I, I lived there for the first I want to say like five years of my sobriety. And then I moved here um, for about three and a half years. And then when I went back there, I just rejoined, Um, you know, it was the middle of the pandemic and a lot of meetings weren't in person yet again. So it was just kind of comfortable for me to go back there. And um, it's just interesting, the dynamics in different groups that I've been involved in. Maybe I'll get to that at some point, but we'll just see where the evening takes us, you know. Um, But I have a sponsor, and I'm sponsoring, I'm currently sponsoring one person, um, and I I should have waited to quit my service position until next week, because right now I actually, as of this past week, I don't really have a service position, and I have to wait till the next business meeting to, to get one, so I'm just kind of helping with cleanup and setup and just kind of seeing where the wind takes me with that. But I, um, I, I grew up in a home that had been affected by alcoholism. So my parents both had, well, my mom's parents were alcoholics, well, not self-identified. So I guess we don't know, but they drank a a case of beer and smoked a carton of cigarettes, like, or, uh, you know, a couple packs of cigarettes every day for their whole lives. And, um, she was pretty affected by that. And she ended up, um, being a self-identified alcoholic who entered the rooms along with my dad when I was eight years old. So they both got sober when I was eight. Um, and that definitely has probably been the most pivotal thing that's happened in my life because I truly don't think I would have ended up here when I did, if I didn't have their example and just the the introduction to AA. Like, I don't know if I would have even known it was a thing if it weren't for them. Um, but growing up, their alcoholism wasn't really like messy or scary or damaging to me in any really obvious way. And they, and they got sober when I was pretty young. So my alcoholism, like the way that I can see it in myself as a young person was a lot of needing to perform and, um, have everyone like me and be the good girl and just be good enough. And I am a therapist now, so I like think about things a little differently, but I just don't, I didn't have a lot of like damage that would have created alcoholism in terms of my environment. I 
was loved. I had everything I needed. My emotional needs were met. Um, but I never felt like I just always felt like I had to be doing more, um, or be doing better or, uh, that one person who I wasn't sure if they liked me, like I had to make sure that they liked me, even if everyone else was cool with me. Um, I remember in elementary school, I was very obsessed with boys and like starting in like third grade, um, which is like eight years old, which is insane to me now. I was like drawing sex pictures in my journal. <laughs> like, I don't even know if I knew where it went. You know what I mean? But like, it was, it, I, so, you know, actually that's a lie. Cause I did, you know, I did, but, um, it was not, I was, the point is like, that's funny, but the point is that I was fixated on like a different boy, like every few weeks. And this is reflected very heavily in my like fourth grade journal and fifth grade. I, um, would just constantly be writing about oh, I don't know if this boy likes me or I, I like this boy. And then the next week it would be like, I don't like him anymore. I like this other boy because he can do gymnastics and he has braces, you know, like I, and, and it was also a lot of, I, I want to be cool. How do I be cool? And which is so cringe to like look back on. Cause I do re revisit these journals sometimes. And it's just so like, I actually think at one point in my teenage years, I destroyed some journals because I was so embarrassed by the raw need to be liked by people. And I wish I hadn't because now in adulthood, I can look back on that and have compassion for myself and also laugh at it. But I, I think I hit a rough patch there where I was like, this is too real. <laughs> you know, I like have to burn the evidence um, it, to the point where in my journals, I would lie about things like this is my private journal that I hid that no one would ever read. And I would write lies in there, which is kind of, you know, I'm like, what, what's the point of that? You know, I would be like, Oh, and they were not always self-serving lies. Like they were just kind of disturbing. Like, I think I wrote once that I had a shrine to a boy in my closet, which I actually didn't. So why would I lie about that? It's just like, it makes it look worse. Um, but I just had a lot of folk. I was very fixated on how I looked and how others perceive me to the point where I would lie to myself or like make up stories to myself that weren't true because it seemed more interesting. Um, and I don't really know where that comes from. I think it's just like baked into me somehow. Um, but I was, it just, that was a theme throughout my, you know, childhood and into like my teenage years of just really wanting to fit in and feeling like I didn't and, and feeling like I was trying too hard, but I didn't know how to not try. Um, and when I was in middle school, high school, whenever kids around me started kind of experimenting with drugs and alcohol, I was really afraid of it. Like I, because my parents had talked to me about alcoholism, they told me, you know, that they were in AA, you know, when they first got sober, they like, had this script that they like read to us, I think from their, you know, I don't know if it was their outpatient or what, but like they just would talk to us about recovery a little bit. And they were like, you know, if you drink, you might be an alcoholic because it's kind of on both sides of the family. Like we are just, you know, steeping in it. And so I thought if I drank, it was going to be really bad immediately. Um, like I just didn't know what that would look like, but I thought, it was just really scary to me. And so I just wasn't even tempted. I wasn't, it, my, my close friends were like not doing that anyway. So I didn't start as early as I think a lot of people who get sober young, um, just out of that fear. And then when I did eventually pick up, I, when I had my first drink, it wasn't what I thought it would be. You know, I, it wasn't scary. I, I thought it was okay because I was with a friend that was a good kid who my, you know, my parents trusted me to just go to her house and they didn't need to like talk to her parents. And that's the kind of parents my parents were like, they talked to the parents of whoever's house I was going to, to like, make sure there was no funny business because they made me and they were like, total deviants. You know what I mean? So they were like, we're not taking any chances, but this friend, you know, it was, she was a good kid and her older sister had gotten her these two little bottles of blueberry vodka, which were like, 
I still don't. I say this when I share and I still don't know what size they are. People have yelled it out like, oh, like I get it. You guys are experts on bottle sizes, <laughs> but I still don't know. It was like in between. It was like this, this big. I don't know. It was a small. It was small. Um, yeah, thank, okay, thank you. I don't know what that was. <laughs> um, it was uh, to the point where I, I looked at it, and I had never had alcohol before, but I just remember thinking that is not going to be enough. Um, and But we, we drank it. I was like, is there anything else? And there wasn't. And so we mixed it with, I think it was like Fresca. So it was like blueberry vodka and Fresca. And we drank it in her bedroom by herself, you know, just hanging out. And I just remember, I don't really remember anything about that evening except for the feeling that I got when it kicked in, you know, when it started working through my system. It was the most euphoric kind of relief that I, and I felt that actually in sobriety, um, but it was the first time I'd ever felt that where I just was out of control in a way that felt okay. And that had never been an option for me. I had never felt like it was okay to be out of control. And I didn't think about it in those terms. I wasn't, I didn't have the language. I didn't have the awareness, but I was just so afraid all the time of how I was moving through the world, like wasn't good enough. And it's dramatic. It sounds dramatic. It kind of is dramatic, but when I drank for the first time, I just didn't worry about it. And I'm sure there's other times that I wasn't worried about it, but it was very obvious to me that I didn't, my brain was not going to work the way that it normally did. And that was very nice. And so I, and we didn't have enough for it to get bad, right? Like we ran out, like we drank what we had and it was enough to really feel it, but not, I didn't have any consequences whatsoever. It was enjoyable. And then we went to sleep. Like, I don't know. Um, and so I think I was like, I've heard a lot of people say I was looking for that feeling probably every other time I drank. And I don't know that I ever got it and like kept, kept it <laughs> the way that I did the first time. Um, and not that I did keep, like, cause it was not in my control even then. Right. I, we stopped because we ran out. And after that, I didn't drink all the time. Uh, my parents were very, very protective to the point where, yeah, they would talk to the parents of the friends I was going to see. They would, um, you know, I couldn't keep, like, I just didn't trust that they wouldn't. I think my mom went through my room, like looking for stuff because she just knew what she was doing at my age, you know? And so yeah, they, they just ruined it for me pretty much the whole time. Um, but I did everything that I did socially needed to have drugs or alcohol involved. And drugs, I say drugs, like it's not even a drug anymore. Like I would smoke weed. I didn't, I did like a couple other things, but I really wasn't doing drugs, drugs. I just was drinking and smoking weed and, um, in various friends' basements whose parents like didn't care as much. And it was really fun. Um, but outside of those times, I felt like, like the friends that I drank with, the friends that I smoked with, they weren't my friends in real life. Like at school, I wasn't hanging out with them. I was hanging out with like the quote smart kids, you know, and they weren't the same groups. So I, my social life was pretty fractured from that point. And eventually I just became more and more isolated because not necessarily as a result of the drinking, but in correlation with the drinking, my mental health or just the way that I felt about life was going downhill like pretty quickly. Um, during my senior year of high school, I was feeling really depressed. I thought it was depression. Um, so I went to my parents and I said, I think I need to go to a doctor to like get some pills for this. And um, I guess they don't make that pill that will fix that. But I, I didn't know that. I just wanted to feel better. And I didn't want to, I just didn't know how, why life felt so hard for me when I could see my friends, like just doing everything. Like they did their homework. I'm like, what? And they didn't cry about it. And they, they didn't, you know, it just like doing the things that you need to do to live was, was hard for me. And I didn't understand why. And so they, they kind of sensed something was going on. They didn't really know that I was drinking, but they sent me to this counseling program that they had gone to when they were getting sober, which also works on people who like 
have other issues. So I was like, okay, I'll go there. And they told me to stop or I had to sign a thing saying I wasn't going to drink while I was there. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to drink in the building. Like, I'm not like that. But I I really thought that's what it meant. And in hindsight, I'm like, oh, my God, this is so stupid. Like, therapy doesn't work if you're using stuff. Like, it doesn't work that well. Um, and neither does whatever this was, which was, like, kind of outpatient. Anyway, I was hungover when I signed that paper. Um, but I started going, and it was supposed to be a 12-week program. And I was there for, <laughs> I think, like a year and a half. Um, and... I I don't know if anyone ever finished in 12 weeks. That's just what they told me when I started. And they had me going to meetings. Um, I, I think I did admit my drinking at one point, and they had me go to meetings. And I just didn't – I'd been in meetings. I was like, I know AA. Like, I know this. I've lived it. You know, like, lived it my whole life. Um, expert in AA. And I, cause I had been sitting in the back coloring for like 10 years. Um, and I didn't feel like it was for me. I just didn't, it was great for my parents. It saved their marriage. And I recognized that I knew it was a good place. I knew it wasn't, it didn't feel like weird or creepy to me to go to meetings. I just was like, yeah, this is fine, but not for me. Um, but at some point I, connected with a teacher at my high school who I had become like kind of friends with because she wasn't my teacher. Um, we were working on a play together and I realized that she was in AA because she mentioned someone that my parents knew and she took me to a young people's meeting and this was in towards the end of my senior year of high school and I did not know that part of AA existed. Um, I just knew like the meetings my parents had taken me to which were all people their age or older and this was just kind of a revelation. I was like, there's a cute boy here. I'm going to come back. <laughs> so I did. And I wasn't an alcoholic. I was visiting because my family is alcoholic and, you know, just kind of coming to open meetings as a visitor. And I started dating this, this kid who was in AA and going to meetings occasionally, but I was still drinking. And um, at one point after... I was, I, I graduated from high school and I ended up going to community college, which was like the bottom of the barrel in my <sighs> egotistical mind as an 18 year old. I was smart, smart kids do not go to community college. And, and that's, I mean, that's obviously like not, I know that's not true now, but that was my, it was horrifying that I was going to MCC and it ended up being the best thing for me, but I just felt like that was just really a low point. And I was in my first semester at MCC and I was living with my parents. And so all my friends from high school had gone away to college and I was just going to class, going home being depressed. Like I wasn't even really drinking that much because it was just, I didn't, I, my social anxiety like outweighed my desire to get alcohol at times. So the, the pressure I would have to put on people to like make it so that I could get alcohol was like too much for me. Um, so I was just really depressed sitting at home thinking of ways to kill myself and, um, like throwing tantrums, like a four-year-old. Um, I literally like broke a mirror at one point, just, I just had no control over my emotions. And I was just really, I just remember thinking at one point, like, I, if this is what life is like, I'm 18 years old, like I'm out, you know, like, I don't want to do this. And that was a very real thought. And that was logical to me. Cause I'm like, I don't feel happy. I don't want, I'm not looking forward to anything. I just don't want to be here. Um, and I don't even really know like how it happened. I just randomly ended up at a meeting and I want to say it was like my parents wanted to do something with me, but they were going to a meeting first. So they were like, can you just come to the meeting with us and then we'll go. And I went with them and this was no different than any other time I had kind of gone along with them. But for some reason it felt different. It was um, this big meeting. We got there late and I just felt like everyone in the whole meeting was watching me the whole time, which maybe they were, but probably not, you know. Um, but it just felt like the spotlight was on me. And I had never felt like that in a meeting before. And I just wanted to cry, but I didn't know why. And 
about a week later, I went, I asked my mom if I could go to another meeting with her and she took me to a women's meeting and I did not think I was going to say anything. But when they asked if there was anyone who was new, I spoke up and I introduced myself as an alcoholic and I started crying immediately. Like it just was like a reflex, like tears, you know, and I surprised, my mom was surprised. Like she didn't see it coming. Um, and at that point I had actually been dry for a little bit, but I just didn't know what, I didn't know what to do. And I think part of me like reflexively knew that this was better than like killing myself, at least for now. And so I, I, I kind of just stumbled into AA. I had known about it my whole life. I had been to meetings and then never once had I felt like it was for me until that moment. And I still don't get it. Like, I don't understand why I got sober when I did. I don't know why I stayed sober. It has literally nothing to do with me. Um, and it's, it's just one of those things, you know, like I I feel like I came in the back door kind of, um, because my, my story, I feel like doesn't Line, like, I've never heard my story in the rooms, and that's okay. Um, I've heard pieces of it, but I really had a hard time when I got here because I thought at every turn, I thought someone was going to tell me I wasn't enough to be here. Like, I wasn't enough of an alcoholic or I wasn't an alcoholic at all. And I was really afraid of my story. Um, I still think there's pieces of that that maybe need to be examined, but I've kind of turned it over enough times that I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I think it's just that part of me that really needs approval from everyone. Um, and so when I got here, I knew what to do. Like I knew I should get a home group and a sponsor and I knew I needed to work the steps, which is more than a lot of people know when they get here. Um, so I did those things and I started the steps, but I just, I was doing a lot of fellowship with the young folks. I mean, there wasn't really like a why pa thing back then, at least that label wasn't around in Rochester, but it was just, you know, the people around my age who were sober. And we would do a lot of really fun, crazy stuff. We would like, I was, you know, dressing up for meetings, you know what I mean? Like checking, checking myself out in the mirror. Like, you know, I would sometimes like walk in late, like swinging my hips, you know, like just really going for it. I just, that's just how I was, you know what I mean? Like, but but my my intentions for AA were not really like I wasn't really that focused on the recovery aspect of it. Once I got here, I started feeling better. I started um, the first thing I noticed after a few months of sobriety was that I it, I like wrote a paper and it just I just did it like I didn't bitch about it for or excuse me you know I didn't complain about it for two weeks and then do it at the last minute. I just did it. And I know that's not like a promise of sobriety or I, and I hadn't even like really worked the steps yet, but some, that was so different that I was like, it can't be because of anything else other than like whatever is going on here. And that's such a small thing. But to me, it was huge because that was like the, you know, it caused, it, I just caused myself so much mental anguish over small things that I had to do all the time. Everything was very hard. And when things started to feel less hard, that was enough proof to me that something was going to work for me here. Um, and my sponsor, my first sponsor was someone who hadn't, I don't think she had sponsored anyone before. She had like six years sober and had been through the steps, but I don't think she had really gone through the steps with anyone. So um, we, we read the book and we did what she did with her sponsor. And um, she was very patient with me because I really struggled with the first step. I just was really afraid that I wasn't an alcoholic. Um, and honestly, that fear stuck around in the background for a really long time. I, um, I was just, I could look at my drinking from different angles and see it different ways. And I think we can all kind of do that. And we all try to rationalize. But for me, it was like, yeah, I really, on the surface, on the face of it, if you looked at my drinking in a movie next to everyone else's in my friend group, like we weren't drinking that differently. But what I noticed and what was helpful for me to think about was 
I don't know what anyone else's focus was at those parties or those gatherings with friends, but all I cared about was the alcohol. I was just watching the bottle. I was making sure that I had enough. I was the one asking, like, who's going to the store Um, because I looked like I was 12 and I was not getting anything anywhere myself. Um, So it was my relationship with alcohol was problematic to me. Um, And it was a few, I want to say it was like one or maybe two years into sobriety before I realized that I actually believed the first step for myself, that I was powerless over alcohol and that my life was unmanageable. And I don't know what was intended. Maybe someone knows who like really cares about like every word in our literature, but I don't really know what was intended by like the wording and the structure of that step. But to me, it was I, my life wasn't unmanageable because of my drinking, which a lot of people's was, you know, like that's true for them. For me, my life was unmanageable because I was trying to manage it and it didn't work. And I, that was true whether I was drinking or not. I had no trouble understanding the spiritual malady because that was what I identified with most when I got here. That was the part that I felt safe saying, like, I need recovery. Um, it, it was a while where I was like, do I just need al Like, I don't know. Um, but it was that spiritual malady was like very clear to me because I wasn't drinking my face off all the time. Like I had problems that could not have been caused by alcoholism. And I just thought it was me. And I just thought I was bad and I wasn't doing a good job at life. And so coming in here and hearing that we, none of us are good at doing life. Like that felt really, it was a relief to me that on our own, we just are a garbage fire, dumpster fire of life. You know what I mean? Like, um, so that was the part of the first step that got me right away. Um, that spiritual malady, that inability to live life on life's terms without like wanting to kill myself or someone else. Um, but the powerlessness and the unmanageability or the, the powerlessness part and the unmanageability, like as a result of alcohol, that concept was really hard for me because, my drinking on its surface didn't cause that much un- unmanageability. And it wasn't until someone explained the first step to me a little differently that I kind of it clicked. They asked me some questions. They asked me um, if when I was drinking, I could control or predict every time how much I was going to drink. And I was like, well, no, that's the point. That's like what drinking is. And they were like, actually, no, most people can like... <laughs> you know, say and have a drink and they have a drink. And I was like, well, I don't know if I ever said that. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if I ever tried to control my drinking really. But yeah, when I drank, I couldn't predict what was going to happen. And then they were like, okay, okay, okay. Um, that sounds like maybe powerlessness. Now let's move on. Um, when you have alcohol in your system, do you want more? And I was like, well, yeah, that's obvious. I think one time, one time I remember having one drink because we were, my friend and I were like crashing one of her neighbor's weddings and um, she did not want me to make a scene. So she's like, please do not drink anymore. And I was pissed because I was like, why did you let me have this one? Like, um, I wouldn't have picked this as my drink if I knew it was going to be like my one. You know what I mean? But she, she said, oh, don't worry. Like tomorrow night, we're going to camp out in my backyard and we can drink more then. And I was like, okay, okay. Like I had it the next one planned. Right. And in that case, I could be I was miserable. I was annoyed, but I I could do it. And that fact, like I wanted more all the time, every time I drank. And that's not really, oh, you know, most normal slash moderate drinkers like don't have that. And the last piece of it was when I wasn't drinking, was I thinking about drinking? And that was obviously a yes as well. I was planning my social life around alcohol and I wanted to leave every place where I went where there wasn't alcohol. And I was thinking about it, um, you know, not in that sense of like, oh, you know, having a party, let's see how much we need. No, like, okay, who's going to be there? Who's going to bring it? What's it going to be? How much is there going to be? Am I going to have my own? Like, what's the deal? And so that those three things, this person was like, oh, sounds like maybe you're an alcoholic. You know, I was like, oh, 
okay, it's that simple. Cause I, I thought I still had this idea that it had to look a certain way and, um, or, or be like a fun story or, um, like I had to do something really crazy and dangerous. And I don't know. I mean, I kind of did, like I met up with some random guys in a parking lot and went to hang out at their house that could have ended badly, but I didn't, you know, crash cars or whatever people do. Um, I did crash a car, but like not drinking, you know, just being 17 and not knowing how to drive. Um, so the first step took me a while and it was really hard. And I still, to this day, I, it's very hard for me when I hear people say things like, as if the first step is obvious and that's like a prerequisite to doing anything else in AA. And there's a lot of language around that, that I hear that is true for that person. And so it's my deal that I need to like hear that for what it is, that that's their experience, but that the whole stuff around like the first steps, the only one you need to do perfectly. Um, I get that. Like I know the context and I understand, but for me, that was really hard to hear because I like to do things perfectly and I want to leave anything that I'm not really good at right away. So to hear that and still having those doubts, I just was like, Oh man, you know, I was like ca- gathering evidence that I wasn't good enough to be here, um, to be here. You know what I mean? And, um, <laughs> so, so I just try to be aware of, I don't know, I guess there's just a lot of things that I would use to kind of compare myself out. Um, but I didn't, I stayed and I started hearing more and more of where a lot of people's I related to the beginning of their story. I related to what it was like when they, how they felt when they were getting sober. And then I related to their recovery. I, I had this gap in a lot of stories where I was like, wow, okay, I guess that's maybe where I could go if I went back out. And I think that's okay. Um, I hate it when people say like, oh, good thing you got it young or like, you know, I get it. They, you know, they're older people, they got sober older and, and maybe they would have liked to get sober younger. I don't know. But to me, it's like discounting, um, my experience in a sense. Like I, I couldn't, I did not have control. That's sent. That's like a first step thing, right? It's assuming that I caught it and that I decided to be here when I did. And I still, you know, don't know why I'm, why I stayed, um, about a year sober, one of the things that helped me with my first step was that I really suddenly like wanted to drink really bad and there was nothing going on. Oh, what was going on was I wasn't doing my ninth step. (laughs) Um, or no, maybe it was my fourth step. Yeah, it was my fourth step. I wasn't doing my fourth step because I, I procrastinated on it for like four months. Um, and my sponsor wasn't really, I just didn't know you, I didn't know like the link, you know, they say like, we launched and like next, which means you do it now. Um, we were just at a meeting where we were talking about that, but I, my sponsor wasn't like impressing that upon me. So it wasn't entirely my fault, but I also knew like I should be doing it. And I wasn't anyway, I, I was, um, wanting, I just wanted to drink. I think I just felt miserable that my life, I felt like just mad that I couldn't drink and, you know, enjoy myself. And at one point I was, at my grandparents' house and they weren't there. It was at, at our lake place on Canandaigua Lake and they had their own little house on the property. And I was just opening cabinets in their kitchen. And I just had no, I thought I was just bored. Like I literally had no idea what I was doing until I opened the liquor cabinet and realized that I was looking for it. And it was just autopilot. And I took out the first bottle that was in the liquor cabinet, which I think was rum, And I opened it up and I smelled it (laughs) and I just started sobbing and I just wanted to like smash it and I wanted to drink. And I was just, I was so angry that, cause I was like, what the, you know, like, I just want to have like take three. I remember thinking like three slugs would be like a good number, like three pulls off the bottle. Like, no, you know, I could just feel good and no one would know. And I could just go about my life. But I knew, I knew myself, like, I can't lie. I can't have that on me. And I put it back, but I just was sobbing because I just wanted it so badly. And, um, I called my sponsor like 
<laughs> not right away um, and not before that, but, you know, after the fact. And I told her and she's like, oh, wow, you still like think you might not be an alcoholic. And I was like, <laughs> you suck. <laughs> you know, like I was not happy uh, with her. But the, after I, after I was mad, I was like, oh, my God, that that's weird. Like if I'm not an alcoholic, like why? Do, am I smelling rum bottles? You know, I didn't really drink rum at all. So I don't know. It smelled kind of nasty, to be honest. But I so that was really how it ended up being really helpful for me. And probably that's why it needed to happen, because I just was so doubting. Um, and then honestly, like my I haven't had really strong experiences with any single individual step. Um, I, so I've been through the steps four or five times and the first two were the most impactful for me. Probably the second one was the most change that I experienced because the first time I didn't know what I was doing. My fourth step was like eight people. Like I didn't, and I procrastinated on it and then I just did it and then I read it to her and we had like check mark boxes like it wasn't the four columns the way that the big book talks about it it was like um you check off you know affects my and then you know the fourth column was check boxes so that you know can only go so far like I could check a box without really like thinking about what it means to me um and then the second time I went through the steps was three years, three and a half years sober. I had, it was my third sponsor because my first sponsor had two babies and kind of took a step back from AA. And I wanted, I guess, someone who was like going to meetings and in AA, you know? So I got another sponsor who I was like, wow, she looks really sober. She is old and like, <laughs> she, chic. And she like goes to the gym. She's like 70. And she sounds kind of mean, but like she gives hugs. So I just was like, I, I just wanted a cool sponsor. And so I started working with this woman who um, was wonderful in a lot of ways, but she, she like, we'd been working together a year. So by this time I'm like, I think, you know, three years sober and I haven't actually made amends. Like I did the steps, all the other steps the first time, but I just skipped amends and it never really got brought up again. So I was like, okay, cool. I guess I'm fine. And I was starting to come across people whose recovery was very different than what I'd been exposed to so far. Um, the way that they shared about the big book and the way they shared about God and their experience was just very, it was, um, exciting, you know, like I hadn't really felt that, um, for the actual spiritual program. I'd felt that for the fellowship and for like, you know, fun things that come along with the fellowship, but I, I hadn't felt that for the program of recovery. And I started to hear people talk about being really excited about the program and really like making it sound fun. And I was like, Oh, I want, I want to do that. So I asked this sponsor, I was like, I want to go through the steps, but I want to do it quickly because the first time I, it took forever. Like, I don't even know how long, I think like a long time, like one to two years. Um, and she's like, Oh, well, you haven't been calling me every day. And I'm like, we've been working together for a year. I'm still supposed to be calling you every day. Like, I just, I'm not going to do that. Like, I just know. And she's like, well, then you're not ready to go through the steps again. And I was like, okay. And then I got a new sponsor and didn't tell her. <laughs> and that's not, I don't recommend that, but that's what I did. And, um, I got a new sponsor who was, you know, one of those people that was just really excited about doing AA and doing and recovery, um, the steps and the way that we went through the steps was, I think we went through all 12 steps in like four months, which, um, you know, isn't even like lightning fast, but it's just, it was just such a different experience than what I had had before. And when I wrote that fourth step, I had a lot different guidance and it was, there was just so much in the big book that was pointed out to me that I had never noticed. I was like, these words are here. Like, you know, I hear people talk about that experience, like, and I still have that sometimes like, you know, over 10 years sober, I'll have that kind of, oh, wow, I never like read it that way before. But there was 
really, really obvious stuff that I just didn't, you know, I'd read it, but it just was like not there to me. I didn't, I needed someone to explain it and to point out these things. And when I went through the fourth step with this new sponsor, I um, had like so many resentments. I don't even know. I think it was like 140 or like something and something crazy. And I realized immediately my mistake. Like once I got to the fourth column, I was like, wow, this is all the same shit. You know, like it was the same thing 140 times. And that was really annoying to handwrite because I don't like handwriting and I'm left handed and the ink gets all over my hand. And it took me a really long time in an entire notebook. And it was... Um, I was so the, the point of that, like the, the outcome of it was that I was so sick of myself by the time I got done writing that inventory that I was ready to do whatever it took to change, you know, to be different. And, and we laughed, like when I did my fist step, we laughed about a lot of the stuff. I didn't have secrets really. Like I didn't have anything like really big and scary that I wasn't okay with telling anyone. Um, so it wasn't like I had this insane experience with the fourth step where I just felt or fifth step where I just felt like 20 million pounds lighter or anything, but I just knew that I was on the right path. I knew that I was doing something that was going to work. Um, and I knew that I might actually be different after this, um, I kind of skipped over two and three because honestly, I just didn't have any problem with those steps. I, um, I'll touch really briefly on agnosticism because up until I got to like outpatient, I was kind of an atheist, but like really noncommittal. Like I just was doing it to be a teenager, you know, like God's not real mom, shut up, <laughs> you know? But when I got to really thinking about it and um, that kind of dissolved pretty quickly. And I was just kind of open to whatever, which is a little surprising to me. Um, it was just kind of a non-issue once it came down to talking about the second step and like, do you believe there could be a higher power that could restore you to sanity? Sure. Could, could, maybe, <laughs> you know, like move on, you know, um, I just, it wasn't a big deal in my, you know, sponsorship or in my recovery. I just was like, yeah, I guess, you know, there, there could be something. And since then I've had different experiences with it, but it, it just wasn't um, a big thing for me. And the third step was explained to me initially as just a commitment to go through the rest of the steps, um, which I've heard from other people, but I've also heard different understandings of that. Um, and that was helpful for me because I just didn't need that much like noise in my head. I can overthink things a lot. And I think my sponsor trusted that I would go through the steps again. I would have a different experience. I would, you know, talk about the third step, hear about it in meetings and have that deeper level of, oh man, wow, this problem, it's because I didn't turn my will over, you know, like over and over every day. But it at that time, it just was super simple for me. So it just wasn't really a big deal. Um, and going through the rest of the steps, like after my inventory and my fifth step, I just didn't, um, I just kind of did them. The ninth step I had avoided the first time. Um, I really don't like apologizing. I don't think most of us do, especially when we get here. And I just did not want to make myself uncomfortable. I really, really did not want to risk looking bad or having a, you know, someone be upset with me. I, I just, all the stuff, you know, all the basics of not wanting to do amends. And my sponsor is like, yeah, just got to do them, you know, like just got to do them. And I started with the, you know, ones that felt easier and they went pretty well. And then I went to some of the harder ones, the ones where I was like, oh, this is so embarrassing. You know, I had to go to my high school and make amends to an administrator at the school whose office I broke into. Um, and I was just so scared to do it because it, just because my ego, like I just didn't, I didn't know how it was going to go. And it ended up being that, like, after I, you know, told her what I did wrong, like, so that's what I would do. I would say, you know, here's, I, I'm, I don't even remember. It's been a while since I had to make like a real formal amends, actually. So I'm, I think it was sort of like, I would say what I was doing there, not like I'm in AA, so I have to come apologize to you. But like, you know, I'm, 
trying to do things different because I'm in recovery and, you know, this is part of that process. Um, and then I would say like, I feel I've harmed you and here's how, and I would be detailed about it. And then I would say, um, is there anything that I've left out? And then I, if, you know, if they said yes, which actually no one did, um, I would listen, but then I would say, what can I do to make it right? Um, and she's, she didn't have anything for me really. Her thing was, how can I help other kids that are going through what you were going through? Because it, it wasn't that obvious. Like I wasn't skipping class all the time. I wasn't failing. I wasn't acting out and like getting in fights. And honestly, I didn't really have a lot to say to her at the time. Cause I'm like, there's only, you can't do anything for someone who's, who doesn't want it, um, or who doesn't know they need it. But I ended up actually getting a literature rack for, um, the principal's office, like just to be out in the open. Um, I got it from our PI committee and that was her, that was what she asked for as how to make it, how to make it right was to have literature available for the one person ever in the world who reads pamphlets. Um, and, so, and that actually started an initiative to get pamphlet racks in um, a lot of the high schools in Rochester. So um, that was, uh, otherwise my amends were like pretty non, like just anticlimactic. I just, I did them and it was fine. And I don't have a lot of fun stories. Um, but my, you know, going through the steps, like other times, I realized I was like, went through the steps the third time a few years ago. And I was like, why am I bored? Like, I just don't, I didn't feel it. I didn't feel like it was doing anything. I just, that was my fear that I wasn't going to do anything. And then it kind of didn't. And I was like, wow, AA, like what's going on? Um, and part of it was that I had not done a lot of harm, um, in between my second and third inventories. There wasn't really a lot of new stuff to uncover. Um, I did things a little differently. So it was an in intellectual or like mental exercise, kind of like, oh, this is interesting. You know, I can see things from a different angle. But I, I realized after that, that I felt like if I did the spiritual tool, like if I used the tools, if I did the spiritual things, I would feel something certain. Like I would just feel really spiritual, like whatever that looks like. And the reality is I don't always feel it when I'm doing the things. The The steps that I take to maintain my recovery um, are not exciting. Um, I want to feel great all the time. And that's why I probably, why I drank. And that's probably why I do a lot of the things that I do in AA is because I still think like if I just check all the boxes, I'll just be spiritual and it will feel like so good. And the reality is that it's just, sometimes it's just life now, you know, like I do, um, some of the stuff most of the time. Uh, and that includes, you know, I go to meetings, I pray and meditate actually like now I'm kind of doing it more regularly, but there was, there have been a lot long periods in there where I'm just not doing that part. And, you know, doing nightly inventory, again, I'm doing that more regularly now, but I've had really long stretches where I didn't do it at all. And I've had times where I did it religiously um, and talking to my sponsor, meeting with my sponsor, sponsoring other women, doing service, like um, reading literature and trying to kind of just connect with my higher power in different ways. There are things that I just do differently at different times. And it feels different at different times. And I don't like that. I want that consistency. I want it to feel the same way every time, the way that, you know, I felt when I took the first drink. I want that specific relief that you can't get without a substance. And I just can't do that um, because I know it doesn't really work. And so I go through periods of really taking my will back and really running my life. And um, that's when those steps come all back around. Like every single step is so relevant in my life today, this far away from a drink, because it's just that first thing I learned here, which is it's not the drinking. It's really not. The drinking is how I cope with life. And, and I need something to make it okay. Um, and I still need something. And that something is a higher power. And I really don't like that. Like, I don't want it to be that. I want it to be something fun. 
You know, I want it to be something exciting. And sometimes, you know, God is fun and exciting, but most of the time it's like an old chair, you know, like you just sit there. It feels comfy. Sometimes there's like a, like a rock in the bottom of it or like an M&M or something. And it's like, I have to like dig it out. You know, it's just, it's comfortable. And, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think I need, that's why I need to keep doing different things. I need to mix it up a little because it can, I can get stale here. And recently I, I'm wrapping up, but recently I had an experience where I had been really just kind of coasting, um, for a while. And I kept checking on myself, like, am I good? Like, yeah, I, I am. Like, I'm pretty good. And I was like, well, guess I'm getting away with it. You know, just like not really doing all the things that I know are helpful to stay spiritually fit. And I knew in the back of my mind, I'm like, wow, I really hope that I start doing the things again before I get bad. But I just couldn't make it happen. I couldn't get the willingness to happen. I couldn't force it. And my sponsor kept pointing out, like, this is a first step thing. You know, it's a because I was powerless over my willingness, you know, like I just couldn't I couldn't make myself willing to consistently connect with my higher power. And I just kept kind of being like waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like, when is it going to be bad? And it was just a few weeks ago, actually, that I was, you know, having a conversation with my fiance and I realized I was acting on character defects and I wasn't aware of it at all. And it didn't even cross my mind. And then when I caused harm, I really didn't want to apologize. And I was digging in my heels. And that was actually a big step backwards for me. And I didn't realize it until it happened, until I was aware of it, that there was a stretch there, a pretty good stretch where I was aware of my, I had that pause, right? I would have the thought, like the control thought or the criticism or whatever it was. And I could either choose to say it, which sometimes I did or not. And I realized I was losing the power of choice over my defects. And um, I still don't have that with all of them, but there were a few key ones that I was able to pause and pray and do something different, make a different choice. And then if I did screw up, I was really uncomfortable until I apologized or made amends. And recently I was realizing I was really uncomfortable with the prospect of apologizing or making amends. Like I was more comfortable just not doing it. And that was Honestly, like it might sound silly to some people, especially earlier in recovery, but that was like really scary to me because I realized like before I was recovered, before I had a profound personality change, I was not an easy person to love or to get along with. And my mom told me that once. She said, it's, you're hard to love um, sometimes. And she was mad at me, you know, like I'm sure she would say that she didn't really mean it, but it was kind of true. Um, I made it really hard to for people to connect with me and to feel okay and to feel good about themselves in my presence. Um, and I could see part of that coming through. And that scared me enough that I was talking to my sponsor and I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to start meditating again. I think I'm going to start praying again. I think I'm going to start doing nightly review. And she's like, what makes you think it's going to be now? Because I kind of said that before. And I was like, I don't know. It's just a feeling. I just feel like it, that's enough. And it, and it was, you know, I mean, it's only been a, a few weeks, but I've been pretty consistent with those things. And I think it's just because I know what life looks like when I'm running it and it sucks and it hurts people. And I don't want to clean up the, the mess. And then it piles up and I don't want to deal with that, you know, and I'm at a point in my life and my recovery and my growth as a human that I can, I can say that, like, I can, I feel like I have a level of agency over my life that I did not have when I got here. And um, I work in mental health right now. And I hear in my chair every day, people saying, it's too hard. I can't do it. People saying they're the problem. They need to change. And these are things I used to think and really have no question about. Like, this is obvious. And now I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, oh my God. You know, like I can have so much compassion for those people because that's me. But I also can have hope because I know that I came from there 
And now I can sit here and say, it's me, you know, and I have choices and I can do the spiritual actions that are most likely to yield a, a result that I'm happy with. And that is the catch that I'm working on. That, I mean, not working on, but this is my next kind of frontier, I think, is that I still think that there's, I can be a good AA or I can be a bad AA. And I, I hate to say it, but I learned that here in Buffalo, <laughs> you know, like there's good AA and there's bad AA. And that's what I internalized. No one was literally saying that out loud, but the, the, um, folks that I was attracted to in this fellowship, I wanted certainty. I wanted people who knew the right way to do AA. And, and I really held on to a lot of ideas that were no longer serving me. And that's on me. That's not on anyone else. But I'm, I'm at that point where I have, I have doubts about some of these things that I just used to say in meetings and without really thinking if I believe them or not. Um, and, and that's been really hard. It's been really hard because along the way I've had to do some things that really go against these ideas that I had learned and internalized. And, um, my sponsor now says when she got sober, they said, what you wear life like a loose garment. And that is such an uncomfortable thing for me to hear because it is so not how I was raised in this fellowship. Um, you raise, you, you live life like a straight jacket. You know what I mean? Like that's how I internalized it. And so for me learning like the freedom that I'm feeling now is more about, wow, like what resonates with me? What, what is going to allow me to be of service to the most people? What is going to allow me to have compassion for everyone who comes here? And, and that, that's a hard question that I'm still kind of playing with, I guess, or, or waiting for the answer to, but, um, I, I love every step of my recovery journey. It's been, I couldn't, I, I didn't, I, I had a spiritual experience and a spiritual awakening when I got involved with you guys here. So there's just so much growth and so much love that I have for, for this fellowship, um, in Buffalo and in Rochester. And it's just about like recognizing it's not going to look the same forever. And I was holding on to something that wasn't really serving me anymore. And so now I'm here and I'm where I am. And it's, it's in a lot of ways, I'm not checking off all the good AA boxes that I had built for myself. And I'm trying to be okay with that. I'm trying to ask myself, like, what does God want for me? Does God want me beating myself up? Does God want me checking off a checklist when I don't really mean it? Um, and so I, I struggle with that. I've really had a lot lately of like, wow, I am not a good enough person and realizing how hurtful that is. You know what I mean? Like how, because then I project that onto you when you don't do things the right way, you're not good enough. And that's not what I want, you know, for my recovery, for your recovery. Um, so that's just where I'm at now and I'm over time. So I'm going to stop there, but thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.